Hey, this is Horner, and this is the last uh, few problems that we have for the multiple choice rotational motion pretest. And uh, this is AP Physics C. So these next two questions are really difficult, and uh, they're difficult because there's something that you have to know about them in order to solve them. So we'll go through them just so you can kind of see what it's like. So you have a solid cylinder of mass M, has an R, uh, has a radius R, and a string round around it. The person holding the string pulls vertically upward, as shown above, such that the cylinder is suspended in midair for a brief time. So the cylinder is not going anywhere, but the person's hand is going up. Um, the tension in the string is T, and the rotational inertia of the cylinder about its axis is 1 half mR squared. The net force on the cylinder during this time interval, delta T, is, well, let's think about the net force here. Our net force, or the sum of the forces, is equal to T minus mg. So we have mg of the disk going down, we have T of this going up. And that should be equal to ma. But if you think about it, if this is turning, but it's not translating, it's not going up or down, then it's not accelerating. And if it's not accelerating, then the forces are equal to zero. So this is really equal to zero in this ma. The a is equal to zero, so we don't worry about it. At this point, we could say t now uh, minus mg is equal to the sum of the forces. And so uh, that's equal to zero. And since it's zero, it says the net force is zero. That's a really strange kind of uh, problem. Uh, if they were moving, if this was moving up or down, it'd be different, but it's not. It's just staying stationary, just turning. So the net force on the cylinder is actually zero. Uh, just a really strange, strange problem. The linear acceleration of the person's hand during that time interval, so now we know that this person's hand is going up, making it rotate, but it's not translating. Um, the linear acceleration would have to uh, end up being something a little bit different. So we know that there is uh, there is a, an acceleration of the outside of the rim. There's no angular acceleration, but the rim is turning, so we do have some sort of tangential acceleration. Uh, in order to do that, what we can do is we can say the torque is equal to the tension T times the radius R, uh, and that's equal to, remember, that's equal to I alpha, uh, and so now we can say that's equal to I times, and we can just put uh, our A over R. Now, why can we do that? Remember, A is equal to alpha times R. So alpha is equal to A over R. Our linear thing is always equal to our angular thing times R. So we'll just say that it's a liar, um, and so it's LAR. So now we have this. From the previous problem, we know that T is equal to mg since the sum of the forces are equal to zero. And if T is equal to mg, we can then say mgr is equal to I times A over R. Um, that's going to be equal to one half mr squared times A over R. So this really is just, I. this is your I value. So MGR is now equal to uh, this guy right here. And if we go through and do our math, we end up with 1 half M times A times R. So now we have MGR is equal to 1 half mass times acceleration times R. Um, we can cancel the M and the R on both sides. And uh, so now what we can do is multiply both sides by 2. So we're going to get uh, 2G is equal to A, and so that is our linear acceleration. Really difficult problems conceptually. Uh, math is not too bad, but if you don't get the concept, you're going to end up picking the wrong thing. So that one is number 51 and 52. Let's go on to number 53. A uh, figure skater goes into spin with the arms fully extended, and uh, as, they, uh, as they are doing that, um, they want to know uh, which of the following describes the changes in rotational kinetic energy and angular momentum of the skater as the arms are brought towards the body. So one of the things that we can do is think about uh, the angular momentum. The angular momentum cannot change, and it's mainly because there's no external torque. 
So this has to remain the same, okay? Uh, this really does have to remain the same. So for number 53, uh, we know the answers have got to be this one or this one or this one. We can no longer look at A and we can no longer look at D. So the question is, what is the kinetic energy? There's a couple of useful formulas that we can use here. We can say the kinetic energy is equal to the linear momentum squared divided by 2 times the mass. And we can say that K is equal to L squared all over the angular, uh, angular momentum divided by 2 times the moment of inertia. Uh, so as the skater's arms come in, this I value, which depends on the square of the average distance of the mass from the axis, gets smaller. Uh, since the kinetic energy depends directly on the square of the angular momentum, so that's this, and inversely on the moment of inertia, uh, and since I is decreasing, then K would have to go up. So also there's got to be work done to draw the arms in, and this work goes into increased kinetic energy. So this is the correct answer. And if you think about it, they're going faster. And if they're going faster, you've got to increase your rotational kinetic energy anyway. So long and short of it is the answer should be C. For the next question, this is number 54. Uh, we have a sphere of mass M, radius R, and rotational inertia I is released from the top of the inclined plane. If the plane is frictionless, what is the speed of the center of the mass of the sphere at the very bottom? So if the plane is frictionless, this thing's just going to slide right down. So we can just use the equation MGH is equal to 1 half m v squared because we only have the linear or the translational motion. Our m's crossed off and we're left with a speed equal to the square root of 2 times g times h and so our answer for number 54 is letter A. For number 55 uh, this one is a little bit more complicated because now it says if the plane has friction so that the sphere rolls, so now it's rolling down the hill without any slipping, what is the speed of the center of the mass at the bottom of the incline? So this one's a little bit more complicated. I mean, it's really not that much, not that much worse. So let's try this. Um, we know that at the top of the hill, we're going to have MGH. So that's our potential energy due to gravity. At the bottom of the hill, we're going to have two different kinetic energies, 1 half MV squared plus 1 half I omega squared. We know that omega is equal to V over R. So let's go ahead and um, let's plug some things in here. Uh, we know that uh, we've got MGH is equal to 1 half MV squared plus now, for, a, uh, for this object, the I, okay, so they give us I, we don't need to really do anything with I. We can just leave it. This would be 1 half of I times V squared all over R squared. Now we've got to go through and we have to solve for the final speed. We've got to solve for this final speed. Um, in order to do that, well, what we can do is we can factor some things out here. Uh, one of the things that we can factor out is V and the 1 half. So we've got MGH is equal to 1 half times V squared times the quantity M plus uh, I over R squared. Uh, now that we have this, we can go ahead and solve for V. So V squared is equal to 2 times MGH over the quantity M plus I over R squared. Uh, and in order to get rid of the square, we just take the square root of both sides. So we'll get rid of the square here, and we'll take the square root of both sides, and so we're left with this. Now, if you look, this R squared can actually go up to the top so we can move the r squared up to the top. But to do that, we have to multiply the whole thing by r squared. So if I multiply the bottom and the top by r squared, I'm going to get rid of the r squared there. But now I have an r squared here and an r squared on the top. So our final answer should be very similar to, uh, should be, well, not similar to, whoops, sorry. It is letter E. So we don't worry about this. I don't know why I did that. So number 55. This is our answer here, square root of 2mg times h times r squared over 
i plus uh, m r squared. Uh, and that is number 55. Next question we need to look at is number 56. We have a wheel with a 0.5 meter radius, rolls without slipping. The axle of the wheel uh, advances at a constant velocity, moving 20 meters in five seconds. What is the angular speed of the wheel in um, radians per second? First thing we know is the regular speed is equal to the angular speed times the radius. Uh, so let's first figure out what this speed is. We know that it's 20 meters in five seconds. So this is four meters per second. And we know that omega is going to be equal to V over R. So our V is four. Uh, we're going to divide that by 0.5 and we're gonna end up with eight radians per second. And so our answer is a pretty simple problem. That one's not too bad at all. Number 57 is our next question. Uh, for number 57, we've got a skater. Uh, and the skater is going to run into the board here. This is all happening on a sheet of frictionless ice. I thought that was funny. As shown in the top view, the skater skates to the board and hops onto one end, causing the board to slide and rotate. So in the situation in which the following occurs, so we know that this is some sort of inelastic collision. Uh, and for this one, we know kinetic energy has got to be lost, uh, which rules out letter D so we don't have to worry about it anymore. Both linear momentum and angular momentum will be conserved in a closed system. So linear momentum is converted to angular. Um, you could kind of look at that and think, well, maybe, but no, that's not how it happens. Uh, kinetic energy is converted into angular momentum. That one is also not correct. Um, so, it, the last two answers we have is rotational kinetic energy is conserved. That one's not right because typically in an inelastic collision, we don't conserve that. So our answer has got to be letter E. Linear momentum and angular momentum are both conserved. That is the answer. And so we are done with number 57. Number 58, two blocks are joined by a light string that passes over a pulley. And so we've got two tensions, one that comes from M1, one comes from M2, but we know that these two tensions are exactly the same. Uh, they want to know which of the following equations best describes the pulley's rotational motion during the time the blocks accelerate. So to do number 58, first thing we need to do is look at uh, the, the torques on each one. And so to get the torques on each one, what we're going to have to do is think about we've got the torque of, uh, of this one minus the torque of this one. So we've got this one is going negative, okay? So it is uh, going to create a clockwise torque. So this is going to be T1. So we're going to do T1 times the radius. Whoops. T1 times the radius. And then we're going to subtract from that T2. My pen ran out, so I have to do this with the mouse. T2 times the radius, and that should be equal to the moment of inertia times the angular momentum, I mean the angular acceleration. But notice because it is turning clockwise, the angular acceleration is negative, so we can put that negative in there. Uh, at this point, they want us to um, figure out which one of these will give us uh, the pulley's rotational motion during the time that this thing accelerates. So when it accelerates, uh, if we get rid of, notice there's no negatives here. If we get rid of the negative here, that makes this one positive. That makes this one negative. So we have to pick the one where we have R factored out. So there's our R. We've got T2 minus T1. And then that is equal to um, our last part, which is I. That's what that ugly thing is here. It's supposed to be I times alpha. And so our equation has got to be letter B. And that's number 58. 59 is a very badly worded problem. And uh, that's what even uh, the person who went through and and uh, I double checked with Boris Kukinski, who's a really good physics teacher out in uh, Massachusetts. Um, and it says a car travels forward with a constant velocity. It goes over a small stone, which gets stuck in the groove of the tire. The initial the acceleration of the stone as it leaves the surface of the road is 
and then you have to pick. Is it vertically upward, horizontally, forward, horizontally, backward, zero, or upward and forward at approximately a 45 degree angle? Um, the rock, before it's embedded in the tire, doesn't have any zero, it has to have any velocity at all. So it's true that the bottom of the tire may be thought of as having zero velocity relative to the ground, and so the rock likewise also has a zero velocity at the bottom of the tire. When the rock begins to move off the road, it now has a non-zero tangential velocity. Relative to the car, the acceleration is just the usual centripetal acceleration, and it's towards the center of the wheel, nearly straight up. Um, but the rock also has a linear acceleration towards the back. So really, you could pick two of the answers here, I guess. Um, obviously, though, there's only one answer here, so the examiners really want you to think about that rock getting embedded and then moving vertically upward. So the answer for number 59 is technically letter A, although you could argue that it would also have to be horizontally backward. It'd have to be a component of the two. So instead of moving just this way or just moving up, it should be moving up at an angle. Um, and it's not a 45 degree angle. It's going to be a little bit different than that. And those are our answers.